Route 66 breathed its first breath on November 11, 1926. It's not that it was the only road created that day because that's the day that federal numbering of highways all across America became law. As for 66, how it landed on those two numbers is a story for another day. Let's just say that things got rather political in the year leading up to the new law. And while the person championing this highway from Chicago to California wanted 60 as the number, let's just say it may have been Providence that guided him to the double six. After all, it has far greater alliterative properties and would one day wind up in song. That song, Get Your Kicks on Route 66, mentions Amarillo in the lyrics, one of 11 cities that Bobby Troop included. It's the song of a road trip, but the road had already caught the attention of John Steinbeck when he wrote The Grapes of Wrath and later inspired Hollywood with a long-running television series. Years later, two decades after the highway had officially been decertified on the books but not in our hearts, the Pixar folks revived it in the movie Cars. In this episode, we continue our conversation with Brennan Matthews, editor and publisher of Root Magazine. Stay tuned as we take a drive down the Mother Road and see not just Amarillo, but everything between Chicago and the Pacific. And take note of Brennan's perspective because he's an outsider looking in, someone who did not grow up anywhere near Route 66, but has made it his life story. You're listening to Buff Speak, the official podcast of the Paul and Virginia Angler College of Business at West Texas A&M University. I am Dr. Nick Gerlich, your host, as we meet up with the thought leaders making an impact today. There's a reason why our programs are rated so highly by independent reviewers. We are committed to continuously improving what we do. Whether it is in the classroom or online, the Paul and Virginia Angler College of Business strives to stay ahead of the curve, not behind it. Join us in the classroom or online and see the difference. We're WCSB accredited and among the most elite business schools around the world. Reach for the stars and do it with a WT business degree in hand. For more info, find us online at wtamu.edu slash cob or call 806-651-2525. From the Texas Panhandle to the world, we are here to help you reach for those stars. It could have been any old road in the U.S. After all, in the years following 1912, more than 250 named U.S. highways were built. The first was the Lincoln Highway, followed by the National Old Trails Road, Old Spanish Trail, Dixie Highway, Bankhead Highway, Jefferson Highway, and many, many more. It wasn't until 1926, though, that all federal highways were assigned numbers and many more routes were added to the U.S. Atlas, even if they simply stitched together multiple previously existing local roads. A prime example was Route 66, which connected Chicago with Los Angeles via Old Illinois 4, the Wire Road in Missouri, the Postal Road in Oklahoma and Texas, parts of the Ozark Trails Network, and then the westernmost part of the National Old Trails Road. It was a patchwork quilt, but it got the job done, even if there were massive political wranglings to get that designated highway to pass through selected downtown districts. And never mind that the brains behind 66 originally wanted it to be U.S. Highway 60. Uh, but that's a story for another time. It wasn't until John Steinbeck's 1939 novel, The Grapes of Wrath, that 66 broke the veil into the pop culture zeitgeist. Cast as a road of hope for Okies seeking new life and opportunity during the Dust Bowl, it became, in fact and in fiction, a carriageway of hope. But not all Okies or Dust Bowl refugees took 66. Why do you think that Steinbeck settled on the old double six? I think Steinbeck, like most writers, relied on the events, the events of his time to create his story of the fictional Joad family. You know, he looked to what, even then, was considered the most important road in America and used a recent snapshot in time to frame his whole story, The Grapes of Wrath. 
Um, you know, it's true that those suffering from the Dust Bowl used other roads to look for salvation from drought and dust storms, other ways of their farms. But, you know, by focusing on one road, perhaps the main road, then Steinbeck was able to focus his story on the road that he considered the most important to their escape, you know, the road that he called the Mother Road. And you know, just to quote Steinbeck in there, he said, Highway 66 is the main, can we call it right there, the main, the main migrant road, 66, the long concrete path across the country, waving gently up and down the map from Mississippi to Bakersfield, which doesn't actually go to Bakersfield, but over the red lands and the gray lands, twisting up into the mountains, crossing the divide and down into the bright and terrible desert and across the desert to the mountains again and into the rich California valleys. You know, from a literary perspective, Route 66 would have spoken best to the national consciousness at that time, just like it does today. Steinbeck would have been aware of that. And then in 1946, Bobby Troop, uh, traveling cross-country with his wife, penned Get Your Kicks on Route 66, which was recorded by Nat King Cole. The, the rest is music history, with more than 200 covers of that epic tune to date. As the story goes, his wife gave him the inspiration and even a few words of that hook-laden tune. But once again, it could have been any road. Why 66? Well, I mean, again, we have to remember that he was actually driving Route 66 when they made the decision to to be inspired, or not even the decision, when they were inspired to actually write a song about traveling cross-country and about Route 66. But, you know, it was great marketing. 66 was always celebrated as America's highway. Um, it meandered through diverse, fascinating um, a selection of small towns, big cities, desert, roadside attractions, history culture probably have perhaps more than any of the other famous two-lane highways at the time then or now you know 66 represented the nation as a whole and you know we like to think that if we look back it represents 66 now but even at that point because of the route that it actually traveled it still represented the country and as the country opened up especially post-world war ii and people were looking at traveling and they were looking at heading west, which many, many people were. They were hitting culture that they romanticized and culture that they had never really experienced, other than maybe at the movie theaters, you know, the cowboys and western films and things like that. So even back then, it still represented a vision of America, a picture of America that was very romanticized. And there's probably a little serendipity at play here as well, because while the brains behind the whole Route 66 movement wanted it to be called Highway 60, they lost out to a very powerful governor in Kentucky who commandeered that number for his purposes, and they were offered 62, (laughs) but then they discovered that, oh, 66 was available also, and they went with it. The alliterative qualities of 66 are just... uh, they offer so many opportunities for uh, for penning lyrics and uh, all kinds of uh, wordplay and so forth. And uh, it wound up being the best, second best ever, right? Um, they, it yeah. wasn't what they wanted, but is what they needed. So let's skip forward to 1960 when CBS unveiled a new series, Route 66, and that ran until 1964. And While only three of the 116 episodes were actually filmed along 66, it found favor among those loving the open road mindset. Again, how did this happen, and why not the Lincoln Highway? You know, by 1960, Route 66 was already tattooed to the nation's heart and soul as the road that best represented the country. So, you know, you had Philip 66, you had... Nat King Cole singing the famous song, you know, get your kicks on 66. By 1960, uh, Route 66 was just the heart and soul of the country. What most people don't know is that Route 66 became a victim of its own making. Although it had invariably started out as America's main street, linking the central business districts of countless small and large towns across the U.S., as traffic increased, Two lanes became four, and then towns were bypassed. And then in 1956, President Eisenhower signed a Federal Aid Highway Act that created a national system of interstate and defense highways. 
This was the death knell for Route 66, although it would take until October 1984 when the last town, Williams, Arizona, was bypassed, and then a year later in June 1985 when, June, uh, when Route 66 was completely decertified from the U.S. highway system. Just like that, it disappeared from maps and roadside signage. In many regards, the removal of Route 66 was not unlike Coca-Cola's decision that same year to kill their flagship product and replace it with something new and shinier. And what neither realized at the time was that they had unleashed a force the likes of which they never could have imagined. And while Coca-Cola did bring back the old Coke, Route 66 never came back like it was. But then again, maybe it came back even better. What do you think, Brennan? I think it not coming back was actually what saved it. You know, it's um, it's become mythical in 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 how it's viewed both globally and domestically. You know, there's a romance now just driving Route 66 that goes well beyond any enjoyable road trip. You're you're not just having a road trip; you're driving Route 66, right? Uh, Europeans, Japanese, Australians, Canadians, even domestic American travelers have been hitting the two lane highway over the last 30 years, and they're all looking for their own great American road trip, for a taste of the vintage America that the highway once offered and still offers to them, that they're not going to find on any other highway. You know, it's being decommissioned really allowed Route 66 to hold on to its small town American vibe. It allowed these relics of the past to be left in their natural state and in many cases to be preserved. You know, traveling the mother road is not like going to Cars Land or Disney. It's not contrived. It's a realistic, honest experience that showcases the good and the bad that Crossing America offers. If it had have still been a highway that was still regularly used, a, a, an official highway, I don't think that these small towns would have remained as Mayberry as many of them have. I don't think that the ghost towns would have remained ghost towns. I think it would have been more valuable land and they would have been torn down and we would have lost that. I don't think that anybody would have seen the need to invest in preserving their historic look and feel, um, their neon, uh, Mufflerman Giant, um, Twin Arrows, you know, any of anything outside of Winslow along the desert. I just don't think that it would have been perceived as valuable to do so. I think that the land that the all the the, the road runs through and all of these towns and cities would have been considered more valuable and that they would have looked to modernize everything. I think that it not being a recognized highway, that the interstate system actually being the, where everybody is traveling on, it's faster, it's perceived as being safer, more economical. That has helped preserve everything along Route 66. And then the towns along 66 were wise enough to recognize that and start to preserve all of it and as such then promote all of it so that they would say, hey, this is Route 66, historic Route 66, actually. So get over here and, and take a, I don't know, take a bite of the classic Americana and see what America really looks like, you know. And I think that that was a very wise marketing strategy that started off, of course, for the most part in Seligman, Arizona, with Angel Del Gadio, but then it's spread across the route. And now you have other places, like whole states, like Oklahoma, and to a degree, it's increasing Illinois, who have really taken off with that. I would like to see Texas do a lot more with it. I think Texas actually has an opportunity to really use its 186 miles of Route 66 to to bring a lot more income into the towns that actually are blessed to be part of the panhandle. I don't feel like they're doing near enough. I feel there's individuals that are doing a lot, and I think that that's commendable. But I would like to see Texas really recognize how amazing the panhandle stretch of Route 66 is right from the start, as soon as you cross in from Texola. Um, And I don't feel like they have yet, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity. More than 200 books have been written about Route 66 in the U.S. alone, making that a cottage industry itself. What are the most seminal of these books, and how did they capture the ethos 
of this fabled road that was, for all intents and purposes, in the rearview mirror. Hmm. You know what? I think Route 66, like you said, there's just so much out there. If you did a Google search on Route 66, I think you're going to find not. I'm, I, as you said, I think that there's a ton of stuff out there on Route 66 as um, a subject or as a destination or really just as a brand. But I think that if you went to Amazon and did a search of books, last time I looked, there were like 5,000 books or something of the sort. I think that one of the negative things for me personally is that the vast majority of those are guides or picture books. So I think that we need more stories. I think we need more narrative. But if the books that are out there, and like I said, 5,000 is a lot. But of the books that are out there, I would say Michael Wallace's 1990, Route 66, The Mother Road, is by far the very best. It's also the book that was written at a time when Route 66 was very much forgotten by the general population. It wasn't in the mind, the romantic notion, the imagination of the general domestic or international tourist. It just wasn't. And so... What Michael's book did is it reintroduced the world and it reintroduced America to Route 66, not just as a historical destination, but as a living, breathing destination that has 85% of the roads still available to travel. And so he told stories from people inside that book that he interviewed that were fascinating, people of the road, but then he also provided the history starting off in Illinois and working his way west. And so it really built a fire, um, both domestically and internationally, for people to get out and travel and experience classic Americana like they never thought that they still could. It put a classiness sort of back to things that people sort of, I don't know, looked down on, whether it was mom pa motels that they thought looked seedy, and suddenly now they realize, wow, there's a real history to this place. Or... Um, a diner that they thought, you know, that's just greasy food. It's not good for you. But, oh, now they see it and they realize, well, that place has a real story to it. I want to go over to this diner and see this. Or that place looks really run down and faded. Hey, that's a really cool, quirky roadside attraction. Let me go check that out. So it's sort of really rocketed the experience that is found along Route 66 back into reader consciousness back into the American consciousness. Uh, two other books that I would drop as well would be uh, 1988, so a little before Michael's book, uh, Susan Crock Kelly and her Route 66, The Highway and Its People. That's another really good book that tells Route 66 story. And then Jerry McClanahan, uh, Sh um, Shelley Graham, and Jim Ross also did one in 2011, Route 66 Sightings. Again, uh, a lot of imagery, really good imagery, but then some good narrative with it as well. I think that those three books are really collectors. Those books will really show you how it, at least it was back when they were making those books. And then I think that you can grab some contemporary books right now that really sort of bring us into where we're at today. But, you know... Um, but those would be the three books that I would say are quintessential to anyone's collection. Early in the 21st century, Pixar hired M Michael Wallace to serve as tour guide on multiple journeys up and down Route 66. It, it was a fact-finding mission in search of human inspiration, and they found it. The result was 2006's Cars movie, a franchise that produced two sequels and has sold billions of dollars worth of related merchandise. How did cars symbolize the demise of the old road, and how has it influenced travelers today? You know, a lot of <laughs> a lot of people that I speak to that don't have young children, have, they don't know anything about the movie Cars. And so when, when I reference it, I always encourage them, go watch it. It's a great animated film that adults can really enjoy as well. But, you know, Lasseter, John Lasseter, who was head of Pixar, did a trip down Route 66 with his family in 2000. And that trip influenced him so much, getting out on Route 66, 
getting out into the heartland of America, getting out and experiencing these small towns and this roadside Americana and just really what's still available on the great, on a great American road trip. Because each of us have our own great American road trip. Well, we can experience the same thing, but in a different way. And Lasseter was absolutely impacted by what he's seen, the people he interacted with. And then he went back to his Pixar team, his Disney team, and he made a decision that they wanted to do a film that would be uh, basically, you know, a love letter to Route 66, if you will. In order to do that, he had several of his executives go down Route 66 numerous times themselves because he knew they had to get an experience of it as well. What that allowed was for him to sit down with his team and to write the script for Cars. Cars obviously shows a small town, Radiator Springs, that has seen better days. Its people are desperate for its you know, to rehash its glory days. They're desperate for tourists. They're really proud of what they have to offer, but nobody comes to see it anymore. And so it's mm-hmm. faded and sort of depressed. What Cars did was it actually showcased how Route 66 used to be, which is that. These small towns that are proud of what they offer, they're proud of their history and proud of their culture, nobody really comes to see it anymore. In Cars, after Lightning McQueen, a famous race car, falls in love with the town, and then goes back and basically wins um, the the big race, if you will, and everybody's interested in him, and then they're interested in where he's been hanging out, which is Radiator Springs. The town comes back to life, and everybody starts coming to visit the town again, and all of the buildings and the businesses and the people, the residents there, they come back to life as well. The world recognizes them again, the world gets to, to, to meet them for the first time, and their town comes back to life. Maybe it's even better than it was before it was diminished. And so in reality, what Cars did is it brought a whole new market to Route 66, and that market was the international market. So the Europeans especially, but also Japanese, Aussies, South Africans, but especially the European market, especially the Western Europeans, After that film came out, Route 66 developed, um, not developed, it gained a whole new audience and a whole new appreciation. And so numbers of tourists visiting Route 66 just increased dramatically. And of course, who benefited? The towns and the businesses and the people that call Route 66 home. And it really opened up a whole new period of growth and resurgence of interest in Route 66 and in also the Great American Road Trip. Very exciting time. That that film probably, after Michael's book, which really uh, launched a new awareness and a new interest in 1990 and onward, Cars was the next major thing to really do so in the 2000s. So when Cyrus Avery was busy championing what ultimately became Route 66, he saw it primarily as just a, you know, a road that connected towns, and commerce was the big beneficiary of this. Um, um, road tripping was, wasn't really a thing so much yet. There were, there were some mm-hmm. people who were adventurous, but not many. Uh, even by the mid-50s, when my late father took his Route 66 journey with his pals, he didn't see 66 as anything special. It was just the road from Chicago to L.A. And I always tried to pick his brain and get something, uh, you know, emotional and sentimental, but it was just the road. Um, But today it's very different. What are people looking for today as they journey down 66? And are Americans the same as the Europeans and other internationals who come here? Or are there differences in the kinds of experiences they seek? That's a good question. Uh, You know, both want to experience what they would define as real America. And, of course, that means different things. But the Europeans have a view of America that may be a little more tied to the 40s or 50s. But domestic travelers are increasingly seeking a more nostalgic experience on a road trip as well. You know, they want history. They want the quirky side of things. They want the unusual and the unexpected. And they enjoy getting to interact with the people and the different cultures 
along the road. You know, culture that is different than their own. The one great thing about a Route 66 trip is that you honestly, no matter how much you research it, no matter how many times even you've gone down the road, you're always going to encounter something new and something unexpected. It's a crazy, crazy reality. And listen, I love a lot of the other two-lane highways, but the truth is, just because of how they meander through the country and the towns they go through, a lot of those roads are more predictable. And those really are beautiful, lovely roads going through lovely towns, but they are not Route 66. Route 66 really is still an experience of the unexpected. And that's what the Europeans want. That's what the Americans want. And that makes a trip down the mother road, even if you do it every year, you know, new and interesting. What's your message for Route 66 cities and towns today? After all, uh, the Mother Road Centennial is coming soon in 2026. You have the perspective of someone who's not exactly from here, yet you are intimately woven into its very fabric. What should these communities along the eight states that comprise 66 be doing, not just now and in the years leading up to this celebration of American pop culture, but also beyond that? Mm. First of all, let me just say that we love America and we consider ourselves, um, I don't want to say Americans, but we certainly consider ourselves um, very close brothers, sisters to America. Um, my whole family does. We're, it's just we love everything that America stands for. And there's nothing that America stands for that's bigger than the Great American Road Trip in our mind. You know, it, the Great American Road Trip stands for possibilities. And, and, and America stands for possibilities. And I think that as we move towards the centennial, all of these towns have huge possibilities. This is a wonderful period for them to really ramp up their promotion of their Route 66 location and what they offer that makes them unique and special along the road. A lot of destinations, because we work with destinations all over the road, you'll have some destinations that, you know, they really struggle with their, let's say, their Chamber of Commerce to get them to understand that this town or that town is unique and really does have stuff that will attract visitors. Not all people on the Chamber of Commerce understand that they are unique destinations in their own right because they're based on Route 66. They have their own unique history, their own unique buildings, their own unique story um, and personalities. I think that every single town along Route 66, big and small, now, today, immediately, needs to sit down, the, the Chamber, the CVB, so the Visitors Bureau, um, the decision makers, the people who are responsible for promoting tourism to the town and or along with the businesses that are trying to attract domestic or international tourist, tourism and, and identify what makes them special, what makes them unique, what makes their story more than worthwhile to tell. And then once they identify that, they need to figure out how they're going to share that story, how they're going to share that message so that people are aware and then excited to come and see them. I think that it's a huge mistake over the next few years not to really ratchet that up because people are interested, people do care, and I don't care if you're a small town in the middle of Missouri or Oklahoma or Texas. If you're along Route 66, you have an opportunity to actually get your story out there, and you really need to do so. And I would say work with other towns locally, work with your state tourism body, uh, work with the businesses in your town, but tell your story and make sure that people are hearing it so that they'll actually be aware and get interested. And when they hit the road this season and next season and the next season, you'll be at the top of their priority list. And that is especially so for towns like uh, McLean and Allen Reed and Shamrock and Vaga and even Amarillo um, and others throughout the panhandle. They're just such an amazing, there, there really is an amazing uh, group of, of towns and groom and Conway and 
Texas just has so much to offer. It's such a wonderful, wonderful stretch of Route 66 that is understated. And I feel like some of that understating comes from the towns themselves. They don't recognize how special they are, and they should. And what specific opportunities are there for the many small (laughs) businesses? I'm going to say that over. I heard a noise. And what specific opportunities are there for the many small businesses that still line this road, 85% of which is still very much drivable today? You know, travelers are interested. They're, They're curious, but they need to engage. You know, these businesses need to engage with their CVB or their chamber, whoever holds the purse strings, if you will, because they work for you. As a small business, these guys work for you. Your tax dollars go into funding their activities. And so you need to make sure that your town, you need to make sure your city is actually representing your business proactively and telling a message that is going to interest local, domestic, and perhaps even international visitors who come to the town and that they're reaching the right market. You know, who do you want to reach? Maybe you're not trying to reach tourists. Maybe you're a different business model or focus that really wants this local um, customers. But if you're trying to attract tourism in any way, you're a motel, you're a cafe, you're a restaurant, you're a museum, you are a roadside attraction, whatever you are, if you're trying to attract tourism to your spot, you need to work with your CVB or chamber and you need to make sure that you're getting your message out. If you have a big enough budget and you can do advertising and marketing and promotion on your own, in addition to working with your CBB or your chamber of commerce, then you need to reach out and discover, you know, who is speaking to the market that I want to attract. If it's Route 66, it's Route Magazine. If it's Classic Americana or domestic road travel or even regional road travel, it's Route, Six, it's Route Magazine. If it's another audience, and maybe it's another platform that you should actually speak with. But figure out who is engaging with the audience that you're trying to attract. And then if you have any money, put it into marketing to that audience via that platform. If you don't have any money, still contact those platforms like a Root Magazine and try to develop a relationship so that you can find out how can we work together. Is there any way that you can support us? For example, us. We can't always get people into the magazine as an advertising partner, but our social media is very busy and very uh, enthusiastic, and our followers are always enthusiastic. So we'll use our website, we'll use our social media to really promote events and businesses and destinations and stories that can't necessarily get into the magazine. So just don't sit back and wait for people to find you. Be proactive and actually reach out to the people and the platforms that are going to be able to help get you in front of your market. Lastly, there has been a lot of decay along 66 in recent years. Buildings are falling down or being demolished, and old neon signs are being removed, sometimes going to private collections, museums, sign parks, and sometimes going to the scrapper, but nearly always being removed because they had long lost their commercial relevance. Do you think that... Route 66 will survive long enough, at least in terms of travel and historic appeal, to reach its 125th birthday in 2051? That is, um, you know, I tend to be a positive person. Say it over. optimistic. Say it over. You know, I tend to be a pretty positive person. I try to be optimistic. And I really do believe in the longevity of Route 66. But if I'm honest, I have to say I don't know. I think there's so many things that even in the last year have gone missing via um, weather or via vandalism or because of neglect or because of intentional, you know, people set, um, setting fire to their own properties to be able to get insurance payouts so they can walk away. Um, like you said, signs that, being purchased by private collectors and disappearing off the road, people selling to others who may not have the same vision as they do to preserve an iconic location, be it a motel or a restaurant or 
this or that. And so, you know, the right opportunity comes along and they'll tear that down and put up a new fast food restaurant or a new car lot or something. I honestly am not sure. Uh, my gut tells me no. I think that some version of Route 66 will, will likely be there for years to come. But I honestly believe that it's like anything else. The local people who make up Route 66, these towns, these cities, and these businesses themselves have to find significant value in what they offer. People only preserve what they feel is valuable enough to preserve. So they need to really recognize that they're financially viable investments. Or else why would they continue doing it? You know, it's really romantic to think about having a historic hotel or having a really, you know, iconic motel or a great roadside attraction. But, you know, we have a saying at Root Magazine, nothing is as tasty as nostalgia. But you know what? You can't literally eat it. And so if these businesses do not get the income that they need, then they're no longer viable. And as things become more valuable than the business, such as the land that it's sitting on, then that inevitably is going to end up becoming the focus. And then Route 66 will very much fade away and become just another old two-lane that does have aspects that are historical. But it, what we know now is Route 66 will be long gone. And to be very honest, in the last year, the routes changed so much since the last time I was on it, which was just the same year that COVID struck, that I'm even concerned over what I see this year when I jump on it next month. So I'm not really sure. I think a lot's going to depend on these towns and these cities to market their businesses, to market their Route 66 stretches, and to really make sure that they're protecting it and preserving it. When we come back, we'll hear about Brennan's new book, Hitting Shelves, this fall. The economy always leading in the daily news. It's no secret that there is a shortage of professionals who understand what's going on in this world. Master of Science in Finance and Economics prepares the next generation of thought leaders who know how to prepare institutions and companies for the great unknown. Whether you seek employment in the business, government, or as an instructor, the MSFE will ground you in all the theory and show you how to put it into practice. Demand meets supply at the corner of finance and economics. It's no mistake that our MSFE is consistently rated as one of the strongest in the nation. We're double ACSB accredited and among the most elite of business schools around the world. Reach for the stars and do it with a WT MSFE in hand. Waivers are offered for the GMAT. For more information, find us at wtamu.edu slash cob or call 806-651-2500. From the Texas Panhandle to the world, we're here to help you reach those stars. While there have been Route 66 books published from memoirs to fine art photography, triptychs, and more, there is no shortage of new titles appearing. Michael Wallace once said that there's no limit to different perspectives on this familiar road, that we can never say definitively that everything that needs to be written has been written. This October, your Miles to Go, An African Family in Search of America along Route 66, will be released by University of New Mexico Press. They are no strangers to publishing Route 66 books, along with other university presses and private publishers. What makes your book unique among the many others? You know, one of the frustrating things when we were working on uh, Miles to Go was that a lot of literary agents loved the idea, but said, oh, it's too hard to sell. There's too many Route 66 books out there. And then uh, my agent, when I, decide, when I, you know, they say getting an agent is harder than getting published, and it's, it's actually quite true. But I had a great literary agent. He since passed away, sadly, from cancer. But he was an amazing agent and had so much optimism. But every single publisher that he approached at least the big five, basically said, look, we love the idea, but there's too many Route 66 books out there. 
We already have what we need on the market, and I just don't think that we're going to be able to compete with them with any new book. And so they never really had this vision that we had. What they were referring to was the plethora of guides and picture books and really a lot of the same over and over and over. And now there's definitely room for those books, and I think many of them are needed. I don't think personally as a collector that we need 5,000 of the same thing, but that's just me. I think that what we need are up-to-date modern guides and books since so much has changed on the road. And so there's definitely room for new books in that, that field because the roads change so much. But what makes Miles to go different, so different than what's currently out there, and really I think what we need right now is that it's a nonfiction narrative. It's, it's like a travelogue, if you will, but with a lot more uh, narrative to it. And I think Miles to go tells the story, our story, of a family that came over from Africa, a mixed race family, and we wanted to really get a good sense of America, to discover America, if you will, afresh. Because I hadn't been in America for like 20 years. And other than New York, my wife and son had never been in America. So we were really keen to get over and, and sort of discover America. And then my wife had really insisted that we go to California because she really wanted to see California. And I had asked her, what route do you want to take? And that is even how we accidentally discovered Route 66 as we were doing research to discover which route to take to get down to sunny California. Of course, we discovered Route 66, Chicago to LA. So this book really details our journey from coming from Africa to discovering Route 66 as we set out to discover America. On this journey, we met a plethora of colorful characters, unique individuals, from Charles Manson's daughter to people under uh, work release, you know, who have been arrested, but they're out doing work as part of their uh, parole release program, to gangbangers, to our introduction to the whole volunteer uh, at museums and other historic sites um, culture. We've never seen that before, you know. Everything was really new and unexpected. And so we were seeing America very much for the first time. We were coming face-to-face -face with this whole volunteer culture. Uh, for us, we had never, ever gone to places that were actually destinations in their own right simply because they were relics. You know, in our mind, coming out of our world, if this place has been abandoned, it's abandoned. You avoid it. But along Route 66, relics and long closed places become destinations in their own right. We had never been to a ghost town before. Um, Mid-century American advertising, we had, we had no idea outside of books what that looked like and what that felt like, and so on and so forth. And so Miles to Go really is a, is, it's a story. It's a true story, a nonfiction narrative story that celebrates America, but is honest about America as it's found along Route 66. We had wonderful discussions with people that dealt with race or politics, that dealt with drug abuse in small towns and in bigger cities. Um, you know, we really got up close and personal to get American perspectives on Route 66 or on where America is going or on what America is as a country. America is a country that was really founded as an idea. And so, you know, does that idea still persist today? And is it still logical and relevant today? We had great conversations with Democrats and Republicans, with big city and small town people. And all of this is really contained in the book. And then, of course, there's a, a real our response to everything coming from Africa with, with our own uh, perspectives and experiences coming out of Kenya. So it's a fresh story that hasn't really been told in the plethora of guides and photo books that are on the market. And so I think that's what really makes it unique. And that's what the University of New Mexico really recognized and picked up on. And so it's exciting for us to get this story out there because it's a book that celebrates America, not in, um, not in the time capsule, but in modern-day, contemporary, living, breathing America, warts and all, 
along Route 66. Is it true then that the stories told in this book were, were what led you to publish Root Magazine in the first place? Yeah. So I didn't want to do another magazine. I actually said, no, I don't want to do it. But I was so impacted by the trip that I knew a book was going to come out of it. And so I set to work after the first trip in 2016 to really put our experiences down, you know, just the bones, if you will, the bare bones of a book. Anyone who's ever written a book knows you sort of frame it out. And so I was so overwhelmed by everything we experienced along with 66 that I wanted to write a book on those experiences, our, our, our time in America, if you will, along Route 66. To do that, I also wanted to reach out to other respected writers along Route 66. And one of those was Michael Wallace. And Michael is just the sweetest, most wonderful, welcoming, helpful, gregarious guy. I also reached out to two other authors, Jim Hinckley and Jim Ross. And they were both lovely guys, too, and very helpful. That was in 2016. 2017, I decided I got to get back on Route 66, not because of the book, and certainly not because of a magazine. Uh, I just had to get back. And so my wife and I invited my best friend from Kenya and his common law partner, Jenny, and they had their own ideas and stereotypes about America which are fascinating, you know, internationally, Americans are seen as sort of loud and abrasive and, and America is, you know, the land of opportunity, the land of the free, but you know, it's history's kind of new. So it's not terribly interesting. It's not like Rome with the Colosseums and it's not like France, the cathedrals. And it's not like England with big Ben and the bridge and, and all of that history. It's too new of a country, so it doesn't really have a whole lot to offer outside of big city shopping, Broadway and Hollywood and things like that. They came over, and we wanted them to experience Route 66 like we did. As soon as we got on the road, they started sort of talking a lot of <laughs> a lot of smack, if you will, about America. And, um, and Americans are this, and America is that. We literally got 30 miles down the road when I started noticing very clearly that their concepts and ideas of America and Americans were changing very quickly. And as we traveled, they fell more and more and more in love with America and Americans and America's story, its history, its culture, and its diversity, even than I even hoped they would. And so by the time we even just reached... Oklahoma, America, Route 66 had two new converts, and it had sold itself to these people who then went on, by the way, back in Africa, to sell dozens and dozens of other people on Route 66 and on America, and to start to break down stereotypes and negative notions, if you will. It was during that trip that they were so moved that they started encouraging us why don't you launch a magazine that tells these stories? And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to launch a magazine. I'm busy working on the book. Other than the book, I don't really know what the future holds. Because by then I had left Destination Magazine, and I knew I didn't want to move down to New York. And yeah, but the seed was planted. So then when I got back after that trip, I reconnected with Michael Wallace. And Michael said, man, that is what we need. We need a great Route 66 focused magazine that's going to be high quality and going to tell good stories. Going to tell stories of the road in a professional, respectful manner that really re could reach a wider audience. So it was actually from that trip, from watching the impact on them, from feeling the impact once again on Kate and I, from listening to other people to encourage us, people connected to the road who knew the road. Um, share that they felt that this was something that was needed and and that we could really meet that need and I knew it was a need that we felt because there was no such thing out there at the time that caused us to say you know what fine we'll launch a magazine that was a storytelling magazine high quality it'd be a national magazine in all the main bookstores and um 
and it would allow us to really share our journey and it would allow uh, us to help the people along the road share their journey with a wider audience. And that's where Root Magazine came from. One of my favorite songs is the Simon and Garfunkel classic, America, in which the passengers on a bus are the the central characters all off to look for America. And Mm -hmm. for many years, I often thought that, oh, the the looking for America was, um, you know, the places you went, maybe the people you met, the food you ate, the photos you took. And then it dawned on me that this was a far greater abstract philosophical proposition that when you find America, it's it's not just the, the people or the photo or the, the monument or whatever it is. It is something very, very intangible. Can you comment on that? Yeah. No, I think that you nailed it. I, America is a philosophy. It's an idea. It's this notion of I can get knocked down 16 times, but I'm going to get back up to 17. You know, it's this notion of anything is possible. And it's not just a notion. It's a fact. You know, historically, all these big brands that we know and love today, that we've all grown up with, whether it's Kraft or whether it's Campbell's or whether it's Ford or whether it's, you know, an idea like flying or speaking on the telephone or, you know, all of that came about due to failure. Every single idea, every single amazing idea, every single major development that came out of America was based on failure at one point or another. America is a land of opportunity, and it's always been. And, um, and I think that that is what Route 66 stands for. I think that these are businesses that rose up and seen opportunity as it came down, whether it was to meet the needs of the Dust Bowl era people, whether it was to meet the needs of um, the, the American government as in the 40s as they moved everything west, their troops, their bases, their training, and the road had to be expanded and wider, like in Hooker Cut over in Missouri, um, or whether it was post-World War II with the 50s when real road travel and tourism was born. This whole notion of hitting the road, discovering something new, rising up to occasion, that's an American ideal. That's an American reality that Canada has to a degree. The UK has to a smaller degree. Australia has to a smaller degree. And the much of the rest of the world doesn't have it all. And so America is the land of opportunity, but it's the land of dreams and vision. And a lot of Americans don't realize that because it's something that you guys have grown up with your entire life. You know, I remember, so yes, we're from Africa, but I've also grown up a bit in Canada too. So, you know, I've grown up in Canada and in Kenya. And it was interesting because when I was a kid, the years that we were in Canada, we had uh, like four TV channels. We had ABC, NBC, CBS, and uh, they had the Canadian Broadcasting Channel, the CBC. We watched those three U.S. ones. Um, and that's where you got your Knight Rider and, and your A-Team and Dallas and Dynasty and all those shows. You know, But those were all, for us, they all came out of America. And depending where you're at in Canada, they came out of Michigan or they came out of Oregon or they came out of Maine. But they came out of America. And I'll never forget growing up and we were just inundated with American commercials, with American music, American um, television, American film. We were inundated with the, listen, at midnight, those channels, and you'll probably remember this, those channels went off the air. They closed at the end of the night at around midnight with the American anthem, and then you had a test pattern. Until morning, whenever they came back at 6 or 8 o'clock or whenever they came back, and then it was the American anthem to open them, and then whatever shows were coming on. I learned very early on to have a deep, deep, heartfelt connection with America, American values. And, and I remember a lot of the great Canadian music artists or actors that we loved, we didn't even know they were Canadians because they crossed the border and they were on American billboard. Casey Kasem used to, you know, they were on the Casey Kasem charts or the Rick Dees charts. 
you had to make it big in America. There's a famous song called Big in Japan. You know, if you got big in Japan by Alphaville, if you got big in Japan, you got big globally because the population numbers were there, I guess. The real success, in my book, if you got big in America, you got big everywhere. And so America has always been a beacon, if you will. And I don't think Americans really realize that, just the influence and the freedoms and the benefits that they have based on that. Unless you have a New York Times bestseller, um, most authors don't get rich writing books. Sales of some books are measured in the millions, but for many others, 1,000 units sold is a success. Where do you think you will fit into this spectrum, and what is University of New Mexico Press going to do to help promote your book? Well, the quick answer is I hope a lot. (laughs) Um, But that being said, university presses are notoriously conservative with how they market. They just don't have budgets. They don't have staff. So, again, because of my mindset, how I see things, um, you know, I I really do believe in the go big or go home model. And I really think that a story like Miles to Go will speak to armchair travelers. It'll speak to Route 66 enthusiasts. It'll speak to road travel enthusiasts. It'll speak to people who just love memoirs. It'll speak to people who love travelogues. So I have a great publicist that I work with directly myself anyhow, and her and her team are going to be working closely with me and with the press to really try to make sure that we create as much awareness and enthusiasm for the book and for the story as possible, not just to sell books, because at the end of the day, that's not, I mean, it's nice. I really, I hope we sell a million copies in in the first month, but that's not really what the goal is. We had a story that we thought was interesting and worthwhile to tell, and other people agreed with it. Or I should say agreed that it was worthwhile and needed to be shared. And so my real goal here is just to make sure that the book gets into as many hands as possible to be able to share our story. And just to be very clear on this, the average book sells 500 copies in its lifetime. 500 copies, that's nothing. And so... We don't actually measure books by the millions anymore. It used to be that. The Internet has nicely destroyed that. Um, We measure books really, I'd probably say in the tens of thousands now. There's very few artists, writers, who are actually reaching a million copies. And a lot of those are your Grishams, your Stephen Kings, your, your... And the interesting thing with that is that the vast majority of those books that are sold actually come out of your book being optioned by a major studio and, a, and a, a movie being made, like Nicholas Sparks movies, that do really well. And then people who like to read get interested in your book. I would love Miles to go to get options to be picked up. But um, we're really just hoping that the book, the story, will get into the hands of as many people as possible, not just Route 66 enthusiasts, and that then they will become Route 66 enthusiasts after they read the story and they'll get out and go see these towns and cities and businesses for themselves. What advice do you have for aspiring authors? That's a really tough one because I think that you have different reasons for why people tell stories. We live in a participation ribbon society now. Too many people think that they're great writers and so, you know, there is a notion out there that we should encourage everybody, if, if you have a dream of being a writer, to get out there and write your book, write your story, you know, get it out to the masses. And I feel like we, I don't want to dissuade people from actually writing their book or writing their magazine article. What I would like to do, though, with my advice would be to encourage writers or would be writers to know where their skill set lies. Are you honestly a good writer? You know, I know your mom has probably told you you're wonderful, but what is the feedback that you're getting generally when you share your work to maybe writing groups or to agents or to publishers or to other creative outlets? What feedback are you getting? If you are getting positive feedback, if you are being told, yeah, you have a real gift here, 
you should definitely pursue it. Then I would say, look and see who is publishing your genre of work. So are you a children's writer? Are you a, a nonfiction writer? Are you a fiction writer? Are you a mystery writer? Are you a romance writer? Different publishers are publishing different genres. And unless it's the big five, there's many, many, many smaller publishing outfits than the big five. Unless it's the big five who publish all genres, depending which imprint you're, you want to talk to. Because even within the big five, they have a bunch of imprints under, within the big umbrella and different imprints will publish different genres. But find out who is publishing what. And if, it, if they are publishing your genre, approach them. Follow, go to their website. They'll have very clear submission guidelines. Follow that to a T. If they say, make it this many pages or these many chapters, sample chapters or these many words, listen to what they're saying. If they have a format that is asking specific questions, don't drone on forever. Give them a succinct, clear answer that answers their question. But respect what agents are asking for, publishers are asking for, and be honest with yourself. Don't think that you're a great writer or have a best-selling book simply because you want it to be that way. But that doesn't mean it cannot become that way, even if you don't at that point. Miles to go took four years to get into the format that it's at before it's going to hit shelves. It was a good book to begin with. It became a better book with each iteration. It became a, what I'm told now is a really good book, a great story because um, I had good editors who worked with me. I had good people giving feedback and guidance that worked with me. I'm a good writer, I'm told. And I believe that I am. I know how to tell a story, but you know what? There are, None of us are perfect, and there's a lot of other people that will be able to give us constructive criticism and feedback to make our stories better. We need to listen to that. If we're, if we're, to become a great writer, you really need to listen to the constructive feedback that people give you because they don't have uh, you know, a rooster in that fight. They want you to succeed, but you'll never succeed if you try to go it alone. So listen to the feedback. Respect what is being asked from others before you make submissions. And then if you have a, a book that you really believe in, just don't give up. Don't give up. Just keep on working at it and revising it and changing it according to you know, the team that you put together, how they guide you. And then um, hopefully you'll find, your book will find a home. What kinds of stories are yet to be written about Route 66? Yeah, that is uh, an important one. But, you know, a lot of writers focus on the iconic stops along Route 66. There's basically, you know, like the hot list of Route 66. And all these books are out to promote those hot, stop, um, hot spots. Sorry. Um, but, you know, there's not a whole lot that's focusing on the smaller or lesser known stops. And they all have a story that deserves to be told as well. Um, then there's also not enough written, in my opinion, about black or Latino uh, people and destinations along Route 66, and so it creates a, a sensation that they don't—they weren't really involved, and they really were involved. Um, their stories just haven't really been told as much. And right now, there's a sort of a movement to get those stories told, <clears throat> but I think that that's definitely a very important movement. Um, and of course, you know, the Mother Road is not just the abandoned or long shuttered businesses or iconic destinations. There's constantly new venues, shops, restaurants, museums, Muslim and giants. There's a lot of new stuff coming up on Route 66, too. So we need to learn their stories as well. So I would say uh, a book, books that really focus in on the smaller, less known places, books that focus in on the new things, books that focus in on the people and places that may not have received as much um, fanfare, if you will. So there's still a lot to be written. Um, I don't think we need too many new books yet, just today, on the exact same top 10 places to visit along Route 66. There's more than enough of those. We don't need to continue to recreate the wheel constantly with those. 
But as I said, the road is constantly changing too. And so as it changes, up-to-date books that really reflect that change, but in via a unique perspective. And there's lots of different ways that they can slant or angle a book. But as long as they we come up with new perspectives to repackage information that's already been out there and make sure it's up-to-date and fresh, I think there's room for those books too. Lastly, is there any other old American road that holds promise for its own cadre of historians, authors, and fans? I'm going to have to say no to that one. I'm going to say that the Lincoln Highway is um, is a great old road. You know, the Pacific Coast Highway is a great old road. The Extraterrestrial Highway is a great road. These are all great experiences, but I don't think that there's near enough preservation of the historic businesses that once plied those roads with what was needed to to really make them a road of note as far as being an industry in their own right, the same as Route 66 is. I think 66 is so unique because of that. And so Route 66 will continue to be the leader of the pack. Rightfully so. Our guest today has been Brennan Matthews, the publisher, editor, and driving force behind Route Magazine. Give us your best shot, Brennan. (laughs) Well, um, I think as we've been saying, get out this year and help us celebrate Classic America. Really, we have another saying, you know, and that's that America is still out there to discover. Real America. And so I think you'll probably be pretty amazed by what you encounter when you get out on the road for yourself. And if I can, I'm just going to say remember to grab a subscription to Root Magazine and a pre-order to Miles to Go, which you can get on the University of New Mexico's website. They'll both aid you on your journey, but get out there and see America this year. Route 66 survival depends on all of us getting out there and supporting it. You've been listening to Buff Speak from the Paul and Virginia Angler College of Business at West Texas A&M University. Our executive producer is Justin Lovell, and Allison Hunter is our associate producer. Our co-editors are Maverick Evans and Paul Torres. Lindsay Bjork is our director of marketing and outreach initiatives, which includes overseeing Buff Speak. Dr. Jeffrey Babb is director of accreditation and is our technical consultant. Finally, Dr. Amjad Abdullah is dean of the college. You can find us online at wtamu.edu slash cob for more information about our programs. Be sure to check out our many academic offerings. Come for the quality, stay for the small classes, affordable tuition, and friendly approachable professors. And look online at our faculty blog, profspeak.com, for more insights. You can listen to BuffSpeak on your favorite podcast portal, as well as on our website, buffspeak.biz. And if you like what you've been hearing, don't be afraid to share us with your friends, colleagues, and family. Word of mouth has always been the best form of advertising. Until next time, love one another. For the Paul and Virginia Angler College of Business at West Texas a and University, I am Dr. Nick Gerlich. And as always, go Buffs! Buff Speak.